Hey, Pioneers, welcome to episode number 403. Today's episode is a special one. We are going to be talking about using herbs medicinally, but specifically with plants that are most likely growing outside your back door or in yards, outdoor areas near you. While I love my medicinal herb garden that we have very intentionally planted and brought in specific plants, there is something beautiful about being able to just go and harvest plants that nature and God has already provided while having the skill set to know how to do so safely as well as effectively. So I'm really excited to bring back on today's guest, and that is Dr. Patrick Jones. So Dr. Jones, if you have not had the pleasure of learning from him yet, well, you are in for a treat. But if you were at the Modern Homesteading Conference in 2023, you probably took a class from him while you were there. And he's been on the podcast before where we were talking about using herbs for animals in our barnyard and with our livestock. So we'll make sure and link beneath this episode. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'll put it in the video description so you can check out some of those previous episodes. Or if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast app, everything that we talk about today, you'll be able to find all of the links and resources and more at melissaknorris.com forward slash 403, and that's just the number 403, because this is episode number 403. So without further ado, we are going to dive straight into this episode. And not only are we going to be talking about plants that you can harvest, most likely wildly that are already growing in your area, we're going to be talking about the specific times to harvest them so that you get the maximum medicinal benefits from those plants. And you'll be able to apply those even to some of your herbal plants that you have put in, I hope purposely or plan on putting in purposely, especially after you listen to today's episode. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Modern Homesteading Conference. If you want to learn from your favorite experts and find some new ones, you do not want to miss this conference. It's going to be back at the Kootenai Fairgrounds in Idaho, June 28th and 29th of 2024. Not only are we bringing back some of your favorites like Dr. Patrick Jones, but we will be having Temple Grandin, as well as Jess from Roots and Refuge, Lisa from Farmhouse on Boone, Mary from Mary's Nest, as well as some of your favorites, including Josh and Carolyn Thomas from Homesteading Family, Anne of All Trades, myself will be back there, and Joel and Daniel Salatin, and a plethora of other homesteaders for you to learn in person. And the best part is, we will be having even more live demonstrations than we did last year, and we had a lot last year. So you wanna make sure and grab your tickets now, especially if you're planning on attending VIP because they are over halfway sold out. Go to modernhomesetting.com, that's modernhomesetting.com, and grab your tickets for 2024. Well, Dr. Jones, welcome back to the Pioneering Today podcast. Well, we're delighted to be here. It's always nice to visit with you. Yeah, same. And I am excited for today's episode. And I actually have a funny story. I was going over some of the stuff you had sent me beforehand. And burdock is something that used to grow a lot around here. Like when I was a kid, you'd have it all over your clothes. You know, you'd go out to play, you'd get it <laughs> stuck in your hair if you're a little girl and you had long hair, you know, it'd get stuck in the end of your ponytail or braid or whatever. It just felt like it was very, very prolific. And I've lived in the same area my whole life on the same road, actually. And what's been interesting is over, you know, it's been a long time since I was a kid. <laughs> I'm 42 now. And what's interesting is I don't have burdock nearly as much as we used to. And so this past spring down at our farm stay, there was some burdock in the yard and it was just a little tiny baby rosette. You know, it, it was just starting. It was its first year. And so I was like, I'm going to transplant this into the medicinal herb garden, even though some people would probably die laughing at this, like I'm <laughs> saving this burdock. And um, lo and behold, I think I'm the first person in history who has ever managed to kill burdock. Oh. 
<laughs> it didn't survive my transplant. Well, I did two. One survived and the and one didn't. So I was very thankful that the one did survive. Um, but I, I feel like I, I may be something special in the gardening herbal department that I managed to deliver. <laughs> there you go. We all have our special gifts and talents. <laughs> There we go. That's great. No. <laughs> um, but what was interesting is I didn't actually realize, and so that's why I'm so glad that we're going to have this conversation today, uh, that burdock is best root-wise harvested actually before it produces all of its little cockabers, like we, that we call them, you know, the little seed Velcro-y um, parts. And so I'm really happy to know yeah. that, though, because I've got this young one that did make it. Um, so I will be harvesting it at the appropriate time. So I thought it would be fun because I know a lot of people are really wanting to get into herbs and there's a lot that we can grow, but there's also a lot of plants that do grow wild or in most people's areas that doesn't require you having to cultivate it and buy seeds and seed start necessarily. We can take advantage of what, what nature already has out there for us. So I thought it would be kind of fun to go through some of the more common uh, wild or forageable that it actually were cultivated at one time, but now we would consider them wild. And I'm th dandelion, I'm thinking of you. <laughs> um, so I thought it kind of be fun to kind of go through some of those top plants that people would probably have access to, um, and then right. really talk about the appropriateness of harvesting them for medicinal properties. Yeah, you bet. Well, we, we really are completely surrounded by medicinals. I mean, everywhere you go, there's medicinals. I, I in fact, I gave a little presentation at a, a college a, about a year ago and you know from the parking lot to the building i was walking to and it was right there uh i tr i counted 15 different species of plants and 13 of those were medicinal you know i mean and that's landscape stuff and yeah. if you go into the wild it's even better <laughs> and so uh they really are everywhere um and being able to recognize and access those resources is just a huge blessing and a, and a huge convenience and opportunity. And the quality of the medicine, uh, even if it wasn't cheaper and more fun than ordering herbs online, uh, the quality of the medicine is remarkably better from plants that you've either grown yourself in your garden or stuff that you've harvested in the wild. Uh, it's, it's night and day different how much better they are. Well, I think I was reading actually in one of your, some of your material and you have a lot out there. So I'm trying to remember exactly where I read it and store-bought you, like if you purchase herbs online or from a store, et cetera, usually shelf life is about a year, but depending on, of course, if you've harvested and stored it right at home up to two years. And I think you were saying like, it's usually at least almost twice as strong as medicinal properties, usually compared to what you've gotten shipped in. Is that about after. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, when I, you know, just as an example, if I open a jar of yarrow that we harvested and dried a year ago, it still fills the room. The smell and the fragrance of that plant still fills the room. But when you buy stuff, even from really good companies um, that are really trying to do a great job, mm -hmm. you open it up and you smell it and you, yeah, I guess that's yarrow. You know, I mean, it's a completely different experience. Um, and there's several reasons for that. I mean, they're, there, uh, when I harvest yarrow, I harvest it the day it looks really fabulous. You know, when the flowers are really big and I harvest at the time of day that those flowers are really fabulous, you know, um, versus harvesting the day the combine can come and not just taking the flower, but taking everything the combine picks up and then processing it in a commercial dryers and keeping it in a warehouse. And, you know, I was talking to a, a grower, a professional herb grower, and he said, that a, a lot of his stuff that he's harvesting, drying and selling to the distributors who are then selling it to the next guy, he says, by the time it gets to the customer, it's probably, it's almost a year old by the time they even get it, Wow, you know? And so it's, it's a very different process and a very different product when you're growing your own material or harvesting your own stuff, it's just really night and day difference. Yeah. Well, I kind of like to do a little bit of a spotlight on dandelion just because that seems to be so prolific. And I think most folks either have access to dandelion or have heard about using it. And particularly because dandelion is one where we really could harvest all parts, the leaf, blossom, flower, and the root part. But 
could you kind of walk me through one kind of the profile? Like, what would you want to use medicinally wise? Like, what would you want to use dandelion for? And is that different, the blossom versus the leaves versus the root? Kind of just basically like do a little materia medica basically yeah. on dandelion. Yeah, absolutely. And and we have about a two hour lesson on my, in fact, I think it's on YouTube. I think there's a dandelion Oh, on my perfect. YouTube channel, Homegrown Herbalist, there's like a two-hour dandelion if you really want to learn about dandelions. Okay, we'll link but, to that. Uh, we'll link to that. For those of you who are listening, we'll put it in the blog post that goes with this episode. And for those who are watching this on YouTube, we'll put it in the video description down below so yeah. you can go check that out in great detail. But that's a great example, dandelion, because, you know, a lot of plants have very different medicinal properties based on what part of the plant you're using. And dandelion is a great example. The leaf uh, is a really good diuretic. So it increases urine output. So, you know, that's good for edema. That's good for bladder infections. Uh, it's good for cleaning the system. Um, it also has a lot of vitamin C, a lot of vitamin A, a lot of other vitamins, a lot of potassium, uh, which was a really good idea because, uh, one of the concerns physicians have when they put you on a pharmaceutical diuretic is potassium depletion. You lose too much potassium. And so what God, when he made his diuretic, he was smart and he put a little extra potassium in there. That was a good idea. Uh, but <laughs> so the leaf is, is good. Uh, the root is also medicinal. Um, and the root tends to favor the liver a little more. So the leaves favor the kidney a little bit. Root favors the liver a little bit. They're both have some action on both. Um, but the root's quite good for um, stimulating bile production and bile flow. Uh, which is really the way that the liver detoxifies the body. It puts the toxins in the bile and kicks them out into the intestine so they can leave the body. Um, but that also improves digestion. Bile is the, the surfactant that makes it so we can digest fats at all, you know, uh, and it soothes the gut and lubricates the gut. So it's preventing indigestion and, and colic and all kinds of other nice things that bile does. Um, and then the flowers are edible and delightful and, and uh, really nutritious. They have some diuretic properties too. And dandelion has a lot of other properties too that we could, like I said, we could get into a lot. But uh, harvesting a plant like dandelion or anybody else, the timing of harvesting is, is a really great thing to understand. And, and the best way to do that is just think like a plant. You know, where's the plant putting his energy? You know, uh, when he wakes up in the morning today, what's he thinking about? And so leaves are often going to be best in the spring or early summer when he's thinking about leaves. You know, that's the whole show. Dandelion leaves in the early spring are really delicious and tasty. As they get older and hotter weather later in the summer, they get pretty bitter and dry and, you know, coarse and not nearly as nice to put in your salad. Uh, but they're also less medicinal. Um, roots tend to be better to harvest in the fall. Uh, or in the early spring before he's, before that plant's thinking about putting stuff above the ground, when, when they're still thinking about stuff, resources below the ground, that's when your roots are going to be most potent. Um, and with biennial plants, like you mentioned, the burdock, uh, that has a two year cycle, it's really critical to get those roots either at the end of the, the fall of the first year or the spring of the second before that plant shoots up to flower seed and die. Because okay. once that happens, you know, she's not thinking about roots anymore. She's gonna right. pull everything up and all the good stuff's out of the roots, you know? So yeah, timing's a really big deal. Okay, so I have a question actually on the burdock because I know some plants, like we were saying, the leaf, like with dandelion, is there really any medicinal properties in the burdock leaf or the seeds or is it pretty much you're just really wanting to go for the root? There are, but um, the seeds can be used for cough suppressant things and the leaves have some diuretic properties and some other things too, but um, there's some respiratory stuff. But honestly, there's so many guys that do it as well or better. Go you for know, I have lots easier ways to stop a cough than sorting out burdock seeds, you know? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay. And besides, my, my hair is so short, it's hard to collect them. You know, it's just, it's harder. Uh, <laughs> True. Okay. Perfect. So if you miss the window, you've just pretty much missed it. Go ahead, move on yeah, and, and yeah, catch, yeah. catch it in the earlier stages. Okay. That's right. That's right. Okay, good. And then I wanted to chat a little bit about 
especially with root, because I think more people are probably familiar with harvesting the leaf or a flower of a plant, dehydrating that at home. But when it comes to root preparation, one harvesting it once it's fresh, then what are kind of your your best steps? Is it best to just go ahead and dry that? Should you chop it into smaller pieces to dry it? Because I know my my leaf matter and blossoms, I leave whole and dehydrate them. And then I, you know, make them small right before infusing them into something, but I don't store right. them powdered up. So kind of walk me through, I haven't done much root harvesting myself. So I'd love to know kind of best practices with those roots. Yeah. And that there's some things you can do to make your life a lot easier with roots. That's for sure. Okay, good. Um, I need those. So, so when, when harvesting a root, um, it's really, really useful. And, you know, obviously you're going to wash the dirt off. That's a really good idea. Um, but I always chop them, slice them, you know, like you're slicing carrots. Okay. Uh, and that does two things. First of all, it makes them dry much more quickly, which is good. Um, but it also makes it so that when you want to powder them or grind them, that you can do that. You know, if you dry an entire burdock root, and then throw it in your blender after it's dry, you're, you might be buying some new blender blades. You know, they, they get really woody and hard. Uh, so yeah, I always slice it thin and then dry it. Um, and what you said, Melissa, about leaving things whole until you're gonna use them, that's really a good point too, because um, one of the primary things that degrades medicine is oxidation. And if you powder an herb, you know, you're exposing every every bit of it to the oxygen and it's going to not have as long a shelf life. And, you know, we're not talking huge difference, but if you if you have the room to leave it whole, leave it whole. You know, if it's just, you know, you and your family that have a, a pouch full of mint leaves or what, you know, whatever plant, leave it whole till you use it. That that'll extend the shelf life a little bit. Um, you know, nothing hangs around here for three days. And so I'm grinding everything into a powder because it makes making a tincture is much easier with a powder because it's easier to get the alcohol to cover the powder than a big jar of intact leaves. But waiting until you're ready to do that is to grind is a really good, a really good idea. Okay. And then next question, you actually segued into it beautifully when doing tinctures with root. Now, is it root specific or is it better to make your tincture when that root is fresh? or better once it's dry as far you know, as it, properties it depends a little bit on the plant okay um fresh versus dry uh the only concern i have about using fresh herbs is that some herbs have enough water content that it dilutes the alcohol enough that it's not a good preservative anymore um but some herbs are a little better if they're done fresh. Shepherd's purse, for example, is a little better if it's done fresh. Uh, but the bad news about shepherd's purse is it has a lot of water in it. And so I usually use a stronger concentration of alcohol when I'm doing a fresh, high water content plant. I'll use a much higher proof of alcohol like like Everclear or something. Yeah. And when I say alcohol, just so everybody knows, we're talking about... Uh, liquor i mean alcohol people would drink you don't ever use isopropyl alcohol or rubbing alcohol that'll kill you right right um, yeah we're talking most, about ingesting tinctures that yeah I mean, we're taking things internally yeah. yeah so we're going to use almost everything i do i'm using vodka for um because vodka is usually 80 or 100 proof which is perfect because that's half alcohol and half water you know proof is twice the percent so it's 50 50 basically uh, so all the water lovers are happy and all the boozers are happy and everybody's happy, you know, to, for the extraction, all the chemicals. Um, but if it's a high water content, fresh, green, juicy plant, I'm probably going to use Everclear. Right. Which is 195 yeah, like, for almost. Yeah. yeah it, the proof yeah, is. It, it's almost yeah. all alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. It's like 95%, but you just round it up to basically 100 for calculating. Exactly. That's what I do. I take the easy route. <laughs> I figured that 5% is marginal. I'm, I'm going to be safe there. Yeah, I don't, um, and I do very little math when I'm doing it. I just look at the bottle and if it says Everclear on it, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. And then yeah. this always, always comes up. So I think this is the perfect time to address this. And because a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of people that don't use alcohol um, in their, in their home 
you know, is a, is a beverage for many different yeah. reasons, sure. but for tincturing making one, because it's such a good preservative. And I know some herbs, especially more so roots, I feel like than a lot of your leaf matter really actually need the alcohol strength in order to pull out some of those, uh, you know, medicinal properties. If they're not yeah. water soluble, it's going to have a harder time pulling them out. And the alcohol actually helps with that. But for those, for, for whatever reason who are like, I, I you know, I'm just not going to use the alcohol. Talk to me a little bit about making tinctures with both glycerin and vinegar. I mean, are they better than nothing? Are they, are you really better off just doing something else like doing an infusion or a decoction or something with those herbs if you're not going to use alcohol tincture or do you kind of, kind of walk us through that? I feel like that's where sure. I see a lot of people have questions. So, so first of all, let's address, let's explore. I'm not going to tell anybody what to do, but let's explore the idea that, uh, for example, I don't drink at all. You know, I have some religious reasons that I don't drink. Um, but I use tinctures all the time. And I, I think it might be a good question for a person to ask is if your religious beliefs allow your physician to give you Percocet or Demerol or morphine when you're in the hospital and you break your leg, it's probably okay to take 30 drops of echinacea tincture when you have a cold. Okay. You know, things are created and provided for us to serve a purpose. Um, and alcohol is a very useful thing. Uh, it's probably not ideal to use it in excess recreationally. You know, that's not probably what it was for. Uh, but it has some benefits that are remarkable and really not matchable as a, as a tincture medium. Uh, first of all, it's an astoundingly good solvent. Like you said, a lot of the chemistry in a lot of these plants is not water soluble. Um, and if you don't have alcohol, it's not going to extract. And the second thing that we really like about alcohol is it's a phenomenal preservative. And vinegar and uh, glycerin and water don't have either of those properties. Um, they're both, all three of those thing, things can be good solvents for water soluble material. Um, and a little bit of the, the less soluble stuff will come too. Uh, but it's nothing like an alcohol extraction. So your potency is going to be lower depending on the plant. You know, depending on what chemical you're trying to get, your potency is going to be less and your preservatives power is going to be less. If you did a vinegar or a glycerite with fresh plant material, you're not going to have any preservative power because they're already so weak. You know, I mean, th those will be stinky when you open them in two weeks, you know, so dry material only on those. Um, and with glycerin, I mean, glycerin will grow bacteria, you know, and so don't put the bottle in your mouth and take a swig, pour it into a spoon and be really careful with it. Cause if you contaminate that bottle now, now that's an issue. Um, glycerin has some nice properties. It's very soothing. It has some nice properties too. Uh, and vinegar's got some benefits too. If it's a real vinegar with the mother in it, that's a real probiotic thing, but I can get that on my salad. You know, I don't have to use that as a justification for just using it for a tincture. Honestly, if it, for me, I don't do anything in a glycerin. I don't do anything in a vinegar. If, if I'm not going to do an alcohol tincture, which I often don't, I mean, a lot of the herb usage I do doesn't have anything to do with the, taking a tincture. I'll just take a spoonful of dry herb and throw it in some juice and down the hatch, you know, the plants, the medicine. Right. And the fact is that that plant material is more medicinal than any of those other things, you know, because anytime we do anything to it, we're making some alterations, you know, so. You know, I put it in some applesauce, uh, put it in some juice. If you can, depending on the fibrous nature of the plant and the flavor, you might be able to choke that down. Uh, <laughs> but, um, or make a tea, uh, uh, you know, and the teas are also very good. Hot water is a pretty good solvent. It's not a good preservative. Right. And once you've made a tea, that shelf life is now three days in the fridge. You know, so don't make a week's worth of tea. Make three days worth of tea, you know. But uh, there's all kinds of different ways we can approach things. And uh, if somebody's really doesn't want to use the alcohol, I absolutely respect that. If somebody has, you know, feelings that they don't want to even engage that, that's fantastic. Do that. I love you to death. But but I wouldn't make a vinegar and think it's just as good. I I would just I would just 
take Choose the herbs. Another route in most, yeah, yeah. just take the herbs and then you can, then you know what you're getting and you know what the shelf life is and you know. Yeah. Okay. If you're going to do that much work, do it with something that'll last a long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I have to say sometimes like when I'm doing the, the tinctures myself, um, especially if I'm going to be traveling, like I can get such a small concentrated amount and they let me take it through the airport that that's yeah. easier for me than trying to take all these bags of stuff that could get, you know, bro. I mean, I suppose yeah. the tincture bottle could also get broken, but I pat it really well, <laughs> you know, I packaged it really well. Um, and so I really like the ease of that. Or if I'm getting really sick, um, I've got some tinctures that I want to tincture format because that's very little energy for me to just put a dropper either right on the tongue. Yeah. I'm okay. usually not not that okay. good. My husband can straight shot tinctures. I put them in some water and just down it. But for uh, yeah. me, if I'm really not feeling well, it's kind of more the ease. I don't even have to boil the water to let the tea steep, to strain it out, you know, so kind of depending on, on, on what they are. Um, I do yeah. like the tinctures, tinctures. And for that's, that. that's a really good point on, you said two really important things there. First of all, compliance, you know, I'm a practitioner, I'm a naturopath, I'm a veterinarian too, but I'm a, I'm a naturopath with people. And my compliance with people taking a quarter teaspoon or a half teaspoon of a tincture is way higher than them making tea three times a day, you know? Yeah. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that tinctures enter the body much more quickly. And sometimes that doesn't matter, but for a crisis, you know, if you're having an asthma attack, do you really want to spend half an hour making a cup of tea? You know, let's have a tincture on hand. If you have, you know, yarrow for bleeding, cayenne for shock, there's some things that are tinctures are a really good idea uh, versus, you know, longer term, you know, delivery systems. So, yeah, tinctures have some really significant advantages. Yeah. I also like, I have to say the gardener in me, because some years we have certain crops that do phenomenally well based upon the weather. And then other years we may have very little harvest of it. So I look at my tinctures yeah. as kind of like, okay, if next year's crop of this is not very good, at least I'm gonna have this shelf stable amount of this for, you know, I try to do a couple years worth figuring by the third year, I'll yeah. probably have another good crop. So yeah. yeah, and that's and that's really wise uh, because, and again, tinctures are really the only herb form that have a long-term shelf life. So that's really good. Yeah, okay, great. Um, some of the other things too is when it when it comes to identifying plants because there are some things that have poisonous lookalikes. So for example, where where we live, there's yarrow, and then there's Queen Anne's lace, and we do have poison hemlock. And right. if you're not experienced, those blossoms can oftentimes look very similar. And I know you know this, but hemlock is very poisonous. Like that's when yeah. you're you're not going to just get like. It's one you don't want to mess with. It wouldn't be one you would want to mistake. So what is your best advice or best resources for people when they're be wanting to go out and do this to make sure they're doing appropriate due diligence and they don't have you to come and walk through their neighborhood with them? <laughs> well, everybody come to Melissa's house in September. We'll all go do that. <laughs> hey, man, that is on the docket. And I'm super excited because I know there's plants that I probably don't know that are here that have medicinal properties. So I've already signed myself up for the walk portion. <laughs> anyway, uh, you make a really good point. And, and uh, you know, the, the one of the really, really good principles of wildcrafting is to not get dead. That's one of my favorites to focus on. Uh, <laughs> it's a good um, one. I'm really careful. Even I am very careful. Uh, with anybody in the parsley family, you know, so, uh, you know, and there's a lot of really fantastic herbs, you know, parsley and uh, angelica and osha and cow parsnips and queen angelis. There's all these nice, lovely creatures, but they do have those cousins, poison hemlock and water hemlock that look a lot like them. And certainly you can learn, you know, this really has to be this one because of leaf structure and flower structure. And you need to get pretty detailed and say, okay, one of the things that they, which is a bad idea that they use to identify poison hemlock, it has almost always has little purple spots on the stem. Yes, I've heard that. But every year, some edible plant guy falls over dead uh, because he misidentified poison hemlock and thought it was cow parsnips or something, you know, because uh, that plant didn't read the book and know she was supposed to have purple spots 
uh, plant illiteracy is a serious problem in this country. We need to do something for those kids. But anyway, um, it's uh, some of them don't read the book and they don't look like they should. Uh, sometimes, you know, if the waters or soil quality is not what they need, they're not six feet tall like they ought to be this time of year and they're only little guys and you think they're somebody else, you know. So basically the the, the saying among herbalists and, and botanists and edible plant guys is be humble with the umbles. You know, that white umbrella shaped flower is called an umble. And if you've got a white umbrella shaped flower, uh, pick something else. <laughs> okay, you know? I like this. I, and so this would lead me to my next question. So for me being like, okay, if I'm, you know, not really sure on these buying seeds to grow it yourself. So you would know this is what's been planted here. I know this is what it is, but then you have to be able to trust that the person who harvested the seeds knew they were harvesting them from the right plant. Sure. Yeah. And and that's what I do. I mean, I have, you know, I was out in the hills not long ago. I saw this beautiful Angelica plant, beautiful, obviously Angelica, certainly Angelica, but I got Angelica growing at home. You know, why even take a minuscule risk, you know? And so that really is good advice and that's what i tell my students is if if it's something remotely questionable that has a cousin that'll kill you plant it in your garden and if you get it from a company a real reputable company uh they're gonna have the seed that's the real thing if you get it from your uncle who was hunting deer and thought he had the right thing you know maybe be a little more leery of that one uh but yeah i think there's some things particularly those plants in that parsley family it's better to just grow your own than to, yeah. than to take a chance. So one of the places that I get my seeds from is strictly medicinal seeds. When I'm, They have some life plant starts too, but especially yep. the seeds. Um, do you have any other resources of reputable seed, medicinal seed companies? I've, That's one I know. I, I've bought stuff from strictly medicinal seeds. I've been very happy with it. I've also bought stuff from companionplants.com. Okay. Uh, and they have plants and seeds and their stuff's great. Um, so we had a, you know, my place, we just relocated here recently, but, but we had like over 150 species growing on the first place. Wow. We're getting pretty good over here at the new place now, but a lot of those plants were stuff I ordered from companion plants or, or seed that I ordered from strictly medicinal seeds. And they did great. We didn't have any trouble with any of it. So one, okay. one thing you'll, I will tell you is that sometimes uh, weed seeds <laughs> have very low germination rates. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes you don't get the germination that you would expect from your radishes. Uh, sometimes if you think about how many seeds a mullen plant's putting out, you know, there's uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds from one plant, uh, but there aren't that many mullen plants next year, you know, because they want to, be stratified with bad weather for a while sometimes they need a fire some species you know there's all kinds of different variables with seeds but uh we've had we've had good luck from both those companies getting good material live plants or seeds yeah and but to dr jones's point when you are seed starting if you're used to just seed starting vegetables right i don't know of actually any vegetables that require cold seed stratification but once right. you start moving into a lot of your flowers and herbs, et cetera, they do, some do require that cold seed stratification in order to increase yep. your germination rate. So if, if anybody is like, I'm not really sure what that is or wants to know, I've got a video on that, um, as well as a blog post that lists out the most common medicinal flowering herbs that do require that. So we'll put that beneath this video too. You got a, lots of lots of opportunities to go, to go further with what we're talking about today. So we'll put that yep. down below and, and you can check that one out too. Well, this, I feel like I've just, barely whetted the appetite. Um, I'm so excited for our time in September and to continue learning from you. So I know you've got your YouTube channel, um, but where is, aside from the other podcast episode you have done with us, which we'll link to that too, really good stuff in that one, where's the best place for people to uh, find out more about you and to continue learning from you in their herbal journey? Well, so we have the the YouTube channel just called Homegrown Herbalist. Um, my website is homegrown, homegrownherbalist.com uh, and we have blog articles and videos and things there as well, plus herb supplements. Um, and then we have, you know, I've written a couple of books there on the website too. Uh, 
and we have the school. I mean, we have the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine, which really is a remarkable resource. We've got students all over the world. I mean, really everywhere. You can do the whole thing online. Um, but because I'm a veterinarian and a naturopath, you know, and sat in dark rooms learning long words for a lot of my life. <laughs> I understand some things that a lot of herbalists don't understand. And because I was a veterinarian, I can do anything I want with herbs, you know? So we don't just talk about tummy aches and, and insomnia. We talk about gangrene and gunshot wounds and, you know, it's a very in-depth real world kind of program. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, homegrownherbals.com has all that information too. Okay. Perfect. Which actually brings me to my last question. Surprise bonus round. <laughs> and that is the our flies here on our cows this summer in particular have been really bad. So I know giving them garlic, getting them to ingest garlic can help. Is there any other natural treatments or herbs, et cetera, applications you would recommend for keeping the flies down on the cows? Um, you know, the only things flies are pretty much scent driven. Uh, I was an entomologist before I was a veterinarian, so this is a good question too. Um, <laughs> they're pretty scent driven. Uh, we were having movie night with the grandkids the other night and the mosquitoes came out and we're going to carry them off. And I went over and grabbed a bunch of lemon balm out of the garden and said, here, rub this all over yourself. And they rubbed lemon balm and then they smelled like plants and not like tasty little kids. Uh, so the mosquitoes didn't know to bite them. But so mint family things, you can make a strong, uh, you know, you can put a little bit of a essential oil in a spray bottle and spray that. That'll make them not smell like a cow. Okay. Um, you can feed them garlic. That makes them not smell like a cow. That'll have a big impact on, I don't know if they're beef cows or milk cows. but Beef. Beef. Yeah, okay. So you're okay. If you feed a lot of garlic to your milk cow, you'll <laughs> notice. <laughs> okay. Good, to, good, good point, actually. I'm very glad you brought that yes. up. Yes. Garlic beef milk is better garlic. with garlic. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> unless you're making an Alfredo sauce, then it would be great. But, you know, just a, right. a nice glass of Alfredo, I don't know that I'd want the garlic flavor there. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> OK, yeah. so the garlic ingestion wise, and then pretty much we're looking at, at topical applications um, yeah. for keeping the flies away. OK, yeah. great. great. And, and as long as you're giving them the garlic, that's a phenomenal antibiotic, antiviral, antifungal immune stimulant. I mean, we could go on and on about the nice things that's doing for your cows too. So. <laughs> oh, perfect. Cause you know, honestly, I hadn't even really thought of that. I was just going more for odor. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It'll keep them from kissing each other too, but, but that's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, uh, we may be waiting into for next month is when the poll goes in. No, <laughs> so, okay, great. Well, thank you for that uh, bonus question and super excited to keep learning from you. And thanks so much for sharing all of your wisdom with us. You bet. Anytime. It's great to be with you folks. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. And if you want to learn even more about herbs, you are going to want to jump on the free summer mini herb course that I'm doing. It goes through September and don't worry if you missed some of it, I will be giving it to you all at the end of the mini herb course. So even if you missed a couple of weeks and a couple of herbs, you won't be missing out. I'll make sure that you get it, but you definitely want to sign up for that now. And to do so, go to melissaknorris.com forward slash mini herb. And I'm going to be sharing with you my top 10 favorite herbs, how to use those safely and effectively, and also how to grow and harvest them. So at the end of it, you are going to have a super strong foundation for your herbal medicinal cabinet and growing them on the homestead. So make sure that you snag your spot and get signed up for that. Now it is time for our verse of the week. And we are in Psalms 103 verses two through five. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your disease, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles. And the Psalms are always such a place of encouragement for me whenever 
I'm looking for guidance or maybe feeling a little bit down or just needing, you know, some encouragement. I always find that in the Psalms, they are really like a balm for the soul. And so I just wanted to share this one with you because what a beautiful thing that all of the benefits that we get from God, which every good and true thing floats from him, but that we have forgiveness healing of our disease. I know a lot of us, as we look to using herbal medicine, natural remedies, and even homesteading itself with our food, a lot of us are turning to that because of some type of health issue. And also knowing that our life is redeemed and steadfast love and mercy and renewed energy so that our youth is renewed like that of an eagle's. Like there are so many beautiful promises in this one verse and in just these sentences that I thought it was a really nice place to meditate and to bring all of that forefront and to remember that. Because sometimes when we're going through hard things, it can be a little hard to get out of that rut in our thinking. And so if we can instead meditate on scripture and remember God's promises and his truth and all that he will bring to us, I find it especially helpful to break out of bad thought patterns, but also just to uplift and renew my spirit and my soul. So I leave that thought with you and those verses with you for now. And until next week, blessings and mason jars, my friends.